I would like to present the panel today on small business, small and medium businesses and their, uh, their link to cities and how the two work together. And I'd like to introduce today's panel, which is slowly coming in around me. <laughs> to my left, we have uh, Dr. <laughs> Philippe Boutelier, who is the CEO of the Tegel Project. Then we have Beatrice Couture, who is the Gen uh, Directrice Générale de uh, Innocité. We have Aaron Lander, who is the founder, or co-founder, excuse me, and CEO of Popupsters. And finally, we have uh, Willy de Maillet, the, who is the mayor of Liège, and also a member of parliament in Belgium. And I failed to mention that uh, Philip is, uh, we're talking in Berlin, where he's uh, the CEO of Tegel Project, and I will ask each of the panelists to tell him a little bit more about themselves, so you don't just listen to me drone on, please. Is it about a project as such? So um, basically what, uh, what's happening in Berlin is we are trying to build a new airport. And we've been trying to build a new airport for quite a few years now, um, more than a decade. And uh, we are very un-German in that respect, sort of way over budget and uh, way over time. So, uh, but once we open the new airport, we will close down the old one. And that's where I come in with my team. We are, um, we are a city-owned company, privately organized, but 100% public. And my team and I are responsible for converting that space, those five square kilometers, two square miles, inner city property, into a space for the future of cities. And we call it the Urban Tech Republic. So it fits pretty well in with the New Cities Foundation and the age of urban tech and everything we are discussing here. Um, so it would be more than 200 hectares of universities, startups, uh, small businesses sort of in the field of urban technologies, and then also 80 hectares of in industry. So from idea conception to commercialization and then to mass manufacturing, we'll have the whole value chain of urban technologies covered sort of on the premise, which is pretty unique. I don't know any other project worldwide which is so much dedicated to urban technologies than, than ours currently. And the second part of the project is to have um, a 5,000 unit residential area, which is uh, planned as a smart city district from day one. The two projects are, of course, interlinked. So the whole energy, the mobility concepts um, sort of are sort of planned out of, from one hand, basically. So it's, it's uh, all about smart technologies and putting them into practice. Thank you. Beatrice, sure. I know that uh, you know Cité is a startup accelerator and that you're looking for people to uh, apply for in September, but what else can you tell me about it? Yes. <laughs> so basically, uh, we are a startup accelerator and we were created following uh, the release of the City of Montreal strategic plan. And uh, the idea in this plan was to have a economic catalyst uh, around startup uh, to create uh, an ecosystem around uh, the smart city. So that's how Innoste, which is a not-for-profit organization um, that was created. And we work, we have an acceleration program of 12 weeks, and we work with startups and we help them commercialize their products with cities, as well as big companies. So we are uh, in the go-to-market phase. Um, we work closely with our partner, the City of Montreal. So the City of Montreal is providing mentorship, uh, is providing experts uh, to work with uh, our startups and potentially test bench. Uh, so it's, as you probably know, uh, and you probably know, uh, having a startup uh, is difficult, uh, is really difficult, and selling to a city client uh, rather than a usual client is even more difficult, and the sales uh, cycles are really long. So that's, that's the experiment that we're doing with the city of Montreal, and we're also attracting other cities around the table who are willing to start to work with uh, startups because um, startups uh, know um, more than they probably do uh, what the citizen needs because they are absolutely focused on making sure the end user likes the product and adopt their product. So for a city, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a new experience. And uh, so far, uh, it's, it's actually a good experience. So that's, uh, that's what we do. Thank you. 
Aaron, uh, I know, well, at least on a YouTube clip that you have, that you're suggesting <laughs> one of your mission statements of pop Popopsters is that everybody should be able to start a business, and each one of those businesses should be a startup. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so uh, my company is called Popupsters. We're an online marketplace, and we connect all kinds of businesses to spaces and events to reach customers offline. So a pop-up is just a temporary store uh, for businesses to have a more intimate connection with uh, the types of uh, customers that they would be looking for. Um, we work, connect them to fairs, festivals, markets, and all different types of opportunities, but we're also a public benefit corporation, so our mission is to spark community and economic development by fostering entrepreneurship, especially in low-income, minority, and other disadvantaged populations, and being able to start as a pop-up really can help create lean business practices so that businesses can uh, stay in business after the first toughest 18 months where normally 80% of businesses fail. So our goal is to switch that number around and have 80% of businesses succeed during that first 18 months. Thank you. And Willie, I know you're the mayor of Liège and I know very little else about you, so could you please uh, tell us a bit more about yourself? Okay. Uh, merci. Donc, uh, Liège est une ville belge uh, moyenne du nord-ouest de l'Europe qui... Uh, est à deux heures de Cologne, à deux heures de Paris, à deux heures d'Amsterdam et à peu près trois heures de Londres. Donc nous sommes bien situés euh, au cœur d'une des régions d'Europe. Nous connaissons euh, un problème qui est finalement classique, qui est que euh, les entreprises euh, quittent, certaines entreprises quittent le centre-ville pour se diriger euh, vers les zones industrielles. And just to explain these words, I know we spoke in French, but we will be translating that. For... Uh, so thank you very much for your invitation. Um, um, yes, I come from Liège, which is a city in, from Belgium. It's a city uh, in the northwest uh, region of Europe. It's about two hours from Kern, two hours from Paris, two hours from Amsterdam, and roughly three, three hours from London. It's well located because it is at the very heart of Europe. Uh, we face a standard issue. Um, some businesses are leaving uh, towards the most uh, industrial zones. Donc nous devons uh, attirer de nouvelles activités et uh, un peu comme uh, l'intervenante uh, de tout à l'heure nous le disait pour Montréal, nous créons uh, un écosystème favorable à ces nouvelles entreprises qui est fondé sur quatre piliers. Okay. Le premier <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me. Slow down. <laughs> so we want to attract new business activities and like um, um, she said it earlier about Montreal, we want to create ecosystems that would further that uh, activity. And it rests on four pillars. Donc le premier pilier est celui du financement. Donc nous savons que depuis la crise de 2008, le financement est difficile et nous travaillons là avec euh, des entreprises publiques qui permettent soit le crédit, donc le prêt, euh, avec euh, la, la garantie, soit les participations publiques. Um, so the first pillar of the, this uh, model is funding, and since 2008 there was a crisis, of course, funding has been extremely hard to, to be obtained, and so a lot of public businesses uh, are opting for a model which is based on credit or loans, uh, or they're um, opting for a public uh, participative uh, model. Le deuxième pilier, c'est le pilier du réseautage. So the second pillar is about networking. Avec la mise en place d'un guichet unique pour toutes les démarches. So with the uh, creation of a single window for all the processes. Le troisième pilier est celui de l'accompagnement des créateurs d'entreprises, de, de ceux qui ont des idées. So the, the third pillar is about coaching, coaching the business creators, all the stakeholders that have ideas. Et là, nous avons deux grandes structures. Une structure pour les nouvelles entreprises dans le domaine du numérique, dans le domaine de l'énergie, dans le domaine de la mobilité. So we have two main structures, uh, one for new companies, uh, the digital companies, energy companies, and mobility companies. Et nous avons uh, une structure spéciale avec notre université. And we have a special structure with our university. Et le, le record des spin-off euh, dans euh, notre région d'Europe. And the spin-off record for our region of Europe. Oui. 
Et enfin, le quatrième pilier, c'est celui du marketing territorial. Il faut donner envie aux entrepreneurs, aux jeunes créateurs d'entreprises de s'établir plutôt à Liège qu'ailleurs. And so the fourth pillar is about uh, territorial marketing, marketing about the territory. We have to give, um, we have to make sure that young entrepreneurs want to come to the region, that they want to uh, set their uh, base in Liège. Thank you. Merci. So to further along one of the uh, things that Willie just said, which is how I'd like to lead into this, what can cities do to attract the small and medium business enterprises and make it a, a robust atmosphere for startups and smaller businesses to thrive? And is it just incumbent upon the cities to help the businesses, or is it something that should go both ways, whereas the small businesses can also help the cities? That's a long-winded question, but in <laughs> essence, how do you see the, what can cities do basically to help uh, the businesses? I, I would like to start on a different note, because um, both Beatrice and Aaron <laughs> basically complained about so many startups failing so early, 80% failure rate, 18 months, uh, survival time, etc. I think it's good that they fail, and it's good that so many businesses fail early rather than later on. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, I, either you, you've got a solid business model, and uh, from, from day one you know exactly what you're up to. Uh, if, if you are subsidized heavily and you carry on and carry on and carry on and then fail later, it's such a waste of resources and time, lifetime and everything. So it's better to fail early. And fa uh, so that's my, my personal... Apart, apart from that, um, yes, financing is an issue. I think financing is the most important issue. So if there are good, ide good ideas and if you do have talent, then you need to make sure that you've got the financing infrastructure. Uh, as a city, the most important thing is to get talent. And that's probably the trickiest of all of them. And uh, I don't want to repeat Richard Florida and all that stuff, we know it. But in Berlin, it has worked tremendously well. So it's an extremely tolerant city. Uh, we've got a huge gay community. We've got a lot of culture there. Um, and after the unification in 89, when the wall came down, two thirds of our industrial base collapsed. So we don't have, and we don't have a single, uh, single sort of large headquarter of a, of a big uh, enterprise. Basically meaning we don't have well-paid jobs, or we didn't, didn't have any well-paid jobs in the city, but a lot of talent. Everybody wanted to come to Berlin sort of to, uh, to benefit from this creative atmosphere, from low rents. It's uh, still comparatively cheap to live in Berlin. And that was one part why the startup scene has developed in such a vibrant um, way it has. So we, last year, we attracted more than two billion in VC investments. Uh, we overtook London for the first time in terms of startup dynamic. And that's absolutely incredible. But it's mainly despite of politics. So when politics intervene in these processes, typically it goes wrong. Okay, then. I, I, I I actually totally agree with with what you say. How boring! Uh, well, yeah, I mean, but I will, I will, <laughs> I will add just something. Just trying to be provocative. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I think that uh, the politics, mm. if politics tries to create everything from scratch and to make uh, accelerator on their own and to you know power everything, it's the wrong choice. I agree. Yes. I think that I think there's a there's a there's <coughs> a smart mix that needs to happen. So there are people in the in the population and that that had businesses and they know how to help and other entrepreneurs. What the city can do is su support these initiatives, but these initiatives cannot be totally created and and powered by the city. They can support, and I think this it is their role to do. Secondly, I think that the private companies have a big role to play as well in that ecosystem, and they are a big player. And they need they need to support um, the the small companies. And one one first thing uh, they need to do, and that's what we're trying to do as well with our partners, because uh, we have big corporations that are part of you know C, is being a test bench and actually buy from startups. And it's and it sounds really easy, but it's not that easy because they have big structures as well, and it's not necessarily easy for them to work with small companies. But this is something that they can actually do um, and, and is really important. They 
it, it, is a, it, it is an ecosystem and it's not a buzzword. It, it is an ecosystem and there are many players in there, but they all uh, play a, a role in it, but no one is overtaking the role of each other. They are working together to, to the same goal. Aaron, in San Francisco, have you noticed the same thing? Or? <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. Um, well, to just go back to what you said about my <laughs> comments, <laughs> about 80%, uh, I totally think it can be 80% should survive if they start as a pop-up. Um, a lot of businesses, especially the small businesses that I work with that aren't ever going to be huge, giant companies, that are people that are more creative, they're makers, they're artists, they're chefs, they're whatever, they are doing day jobs that they hate right now, and if they can live their passion and do what they really want to do, then using the pop-up model can really help them do that. And most of them fail because they do take out a lot of resources in the very beginning. They do uh, don't have the education or the, the, the mentorship to know how to start and grow their business, and it might take 18 months for them to start becoming successful. So being able to give them the types of resources that they need using the pop-up model can really help them cut down those types of uh, factors that would cause them to fail in the very beginning. Um, I do think that not everybody should be a business owner and that if it's not going to work for them, that they should find out sooner than later. But you can find that out much faster with much less mo money put into it using the pop-up. Like maybe you're just not meant to be that, but I believe that everybody should have those resources available to them at, from the very beginning and that the pop-up model can really facilitate that. Uh, from a, a city standpoint and how cities can help facilitate that, um, mentorship, connecting the dots between different types of organizations but also different types of businesses. Uh, and pop-upsters, our vendors have naturally started mentoring each other and started becoming friends and have started helping each other find new resources and access to capital or whatever they need to do. And the government can help facilitate that where places like pop-upsters doesn't exist or these other types of nonprofits that really facilitate that or accelerator programs or any of those where those don't exist in a lot of communities around the entire world. Uh, we're all from larger cities, but that's not the majority of the land mass <laughs> in the, the entire world, and we need to support anybody in what they're uh, really wanting to do, and there's public-private partnerships and NGO partnerships that can happen to help facilitate that, but I do think that, especially in low-income, minority, and other disadvantaged populations, they're disadvantaged from the very beginning, and it's not really fair to say that that's a good thing that 80% fail because they just don't have the resources. But there are things that cities can do to make that happen, uh, excluding sharing space, allowing for tax breaks, uh, for helping mentors or being able to do whatever makes the most sense in that respect. Thank you. Well, it's clear that all three of you have touched on financing, all four of you, I should say. Um, and financing clearly is the most important part, I imagine, of uh, most, actually, I don't imagine. I know it's the most important part of almost every business. What can a city or a government do to help out with that? I mean, it's nice to say that financing is crucial, but in Donc, their difficult uh, times, and money is always tight. I would like to react to what has been said earlier about the role of the political politique. So, the city, as all the cities, has its own son council municipal, its own power executive, the mayor, and we have also a power intercommunal and a power national and regional. So, there is un pouvoir politique qui est présent et qui détermine, qui définit un projet. So there's a political power that's there that intervenes and defines a project. This is um, in, in reaction to some of the comments that have been made earlier. So in, in regards to the question about the role of politics. And so there are different levels of powers at play, uh, town hall uh, level, the mayor, of course, executive power, the community and regional powers. Donc, euh, et je me permets de réagir comme politique, puisque je suis le, le politique du panel. And I'll, I may, if I may uh, answer as a politician, because I am the politician from the panel. Pour euh, dire qu'il est vrai que euh, le politique a la tentation d'intervenir dans le processus. 
And it, uh, to yeah. I'd like to say that it's true right. that politi politicians are tempted, they want to intervene in the oui. process. Uh, pensant qu'il a la légitimité euh, démocratique, qu'il représente l'intérêt général. Because they think that they have political legitimacy, that they will naturally represent uh, the uh, general interest. Et, et qu'il est le, finalement l'interprète aussi d'opinions euh, qui s'expriment pendant le processus. And that they would come in and play the role of an interpreter of the different opinions that are um, considered during the whole process. Mais par expérience, nous savons que c'est une erreur. Sauf cas de force majeure, il faut faire confiance euh, au secteur, aux professionnels qui sont là pour le gérer et qui mettent en œuvre le projet collectif. So, but we know out of our own experience that this is a mistake, uh, in, except for certain cases of uh, force majeure, we have to trust the sector and know that in the sector there are professionals, there are uh, the, the uh, professional stakeholders that are there to do uh, what needs to be done, and there is also the, the collective uh, community process. Donc, dans le, le cas de la reconversion de plusieurs quartiers de la ville, uh, que j'abordais tout à l'heure, c'est ce que nous avons fait. Nous avons mis en place des conseils d'administration qui ont tout pouvoir pour mener à bien le projet. So, uh, in regards to what I said earlier about the different uh, districts uh, being renovated, uh, we have uh, a board of directors with, with uh, all full powers to be able to do what they need to do. Et uh, c'est ainsi que nous nous appuyons finalement sur l'enthousiasme sur la créativité et ça donne d'excellents de, résultats. So that's how we can uh, uh, that's how we can create the base uh, for that uh, through enthusiasm and creativity and that's how we can generate uh, wonderful results. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the notion of failure if I if I could. Um, just because there's a little disagreement here and you think it's a great idea Philip that uh, 80% of businesses fail but couldn't you argue that it is beholden on cities? There's always going to be failure, and you learn the most from failure for sure. But if there's a certain infrastructure there to help support or to support better than they are currently are now from government, do you still think that's a bad that that's a bad thing, or do you honestly think that people have to go out on their own and and learn through their failures to become successful? Um, I, I'm not saying that that f such a high failure rate is good. What I am saying is that if you fail, it's better to fail early. Yes. That's the main argument. Um, for the government, of course, it's uh, what they should do, and that's what they should limit their role to, is to create the infrastructure. Um, also, connectivity is a very important issue. Fiber opticals in, in Germany are um, below standard, really. We are lagging behind. Really? Um, that's <laughs> something. surprising. Not <laughs> airports, fiber opticals, you know. Um, but it's, it's infrastructure, it's subsidized uh, centers, it's creating and curating clusters. That's what we are doing in Berlin as well. We have kind of one district that is dedicated to health startups, and uh, one is more for the energy sector, uh, another is more for the mobility sector. And that's extremely helpful, because the, you mentioned the combination between large, big industry yeah. and small startups. That can be extremely fruitful, because large corporations find it increasingly difficult to innovate. So they try to buy in innovation, which of course doesn't work, um, but they can support startups and grow them to a certain size. And to create this environment, that's a, the best thing that the public sector can really do, the city can do, to curate. Um, the financing side we have talked about, um, particularly early stage financing is incredibly difficult to raise. Um, later on, it's much easier because then you can do international financing rounds, they can get money from the Valley, all the VCs are in Berlin anyway, so that's much easier, but the early stage is, is critical. And that's basically it. Thank Just you. stay out. I mean, to give you one example, our former mayor, um, until four years ago, he didn't even want to talk to the startup sector. It was, it was too diverse a group. He didn't know how to approach them, really. And, um, and then about four years ago, the startups created, um, um, sort of uh, selected a speaker, 
and it became institutionalized, and then politics for the first time had the opportunity to deal with one person or one group of people um, to talk with the startup sector, which otherwise, I mean, you have only a limited span of control. By next year, the startup sector in Berlin will be the largest employer by numbers, which is absolutely incredible. What role does talent, in, like in Montreal, we obviously have four major universities. How key a part does that play in the, in the startup sector? And, this, and is, this is major. This is major. You need, you need that talent. Um, and here in Montreal, we are lucky because we have these five universities, so we have a lot of talent. We need to you know, retain this talent. Um, that's, that's, that's our role. That's what we, that's what we need to do. Um, entrepreneurship is a great way to to uh, to retain that talent, um, and um, and you know this is uh, this is this is something that you know schools can can be better at, uh, you know encouraging entrepreneurship and of course it's not for everybody entrepreneurship is not for everybody, but uh, you know it's it's something that that can be highly encouraged. Um, and in terms of the the, eco, the startup ecosystem, I think uh, we have a we need to do a better job in actually representing ourselves to this talent um, and making sure that uh, the this talent knows what resources are available. Um, so I think in Montreal, for, I'm talking for Montreal, but I think our ecosystem here needs to get better at. Uh, representing themselves, making sure that the resources, the services, the programs that are available are um, made public and it's clear and it's more accessible to to these uh, new entrepreneurs. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's really important. And and if I may come back on the on the subject of of the city, I think um, it's a, it's it's a, it's it's all in in uh, leadership. Uh, you know, bringing bringing the pr private companies and the private influencers around the table to uh, start new project, influence them, and actually give them the vision they have in mind, and and empower them to 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 make that happen. I think that's a, it's it's really a leadership role that uh, that as a politician um, is important to have to make sure that all the stakeholders from a city. Um, are really active and, and making changes. Uh, Thank you. Aaron, if you could talk a moment about uh, a situation you mentioned to me earlier in San Francisco, where is it's, it's wonderful to talk about uh, large businesses and small businesses working together, large businesses supporting the smaller ones. Uh, you have a case in San Francisco where there are such large companies where it's making it even more and more difficult for smaller businesses to afford simple, well, not simple things, but important things like rent and, and, and stuff like that. Could you discuss that for a moment, please? Oh, small talk. <laughs> That's, a That's a loaded uh, question. <laughs> well, so, it's not just San Francisco. I'm, I'm confident New York, and yeah, no, it, Toronto, it's, it's Vancouver. In a lot of different places, and uh, it's part of the reason why I started Pop Up Stores. Um, there's in San Francisco, rent is going up so high. Like personal home rent is going up so high for one bedroom. The average is like two thousand dollars. Um, and that's because there's companies down in the valley like Apple, Google, um, Microsoft. I mean, there's some huge companies that pay a lot of money to their employees, give them incentives to keep them there, including uh, stipends for rent, which only inflates rent for the rest of the community. And the rest of the community are working for small businesses. And so when the small business owner cannot afford to pay their rent because these people are fed on campus. They don't stay in the city during the day. They go straight from a bus that takes them. They don't even driving. They go from a bus down to the valley, come back up, uh, and go straight to bed. They're fed the entire time. They're given drinks for with whatever they want to do, um, and they're not supporting the local businesses. And so that's one reason why we're bringing the local businesses to those campuses so that we can start bridging that income gap divide and connecting these businesses on a massive scale to uh, corporate campuses. The, the, we do pop-ups at Google and Twitter and all these places, and the employees really like it because they have disposable income. They want to support local businesses. They just don't have time. They're working a lot, and for 
a lot of the, the businesses that I used to work with in previous jobs, they went under. They, they had to, like, they couldn't afford the rent in the city for their houses, so they had to move over to the East Bay, and then the commute becomes too long for them, and so they just close down, and they don't open up, and they go and start working a nine to five again. Um, and that's a trend that we're continuing to see, and government can help support that by making it easier for people to support local businesses in those communities. And you're seeing this in other cities across the country as well, especially when there's uh, industries that are really high paying, like finance, insurance, technology. Um, you see it in New York, you see it in these other, other, other areas of the country, in the United States, um, not too familiar with the rest of the world and what's going on, uh, but in the US it's a huge problem and the more that we can support the local businesses and get them connected to these people with lots of income, the more that they, they can afford to pay their rent versus having to move out of the city. So I could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Willie, as our government representative on this panel, uh, I'd like you to touch on that topic as well, but also uh, it's a lot more easy for businesses, especially small businesses these days, to be, to be mobile. It's, it's with urban technology and whatever. It's very easy to go to the city that offers the most. Uh, what do you feel the role, I mean, I know, again, my knowledge is Montreal, but a lot of satellite companies and smaller, even smaller businesses can't come here because of stuff that the government offers. Where, where does Liège stand on that? And where do you think the government's role is in bringing in the smaller businesses? Oui. Mais en fait, euh, notre rôle, notre intervention, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, est de créer les conditions euh, de, de viabilité, l'écosystème euh, des entreprises. Et nous jouons sur tous les facteurs, donc euh, les facteurs immobiliers, les facteurs fiscaux, euh, les facteurs de cadre de vie, d'enseignement, de mobilité. Donc, on, on joue sur tous les facteurs euh, possibles pour cela. So, uh, our role, uh, the role that we want to play, uh, is that we have to intervene in order to create the right conditions in terms of viability of the whole system, uh, the ecosystem for that's right for the businesses. And for that, we have to consider all the different components, i.e., we need to consider uh, real estate, the fiscal framework, uh, the teaching environment, the mobility, all of that needs to be considered. Et donc, en, en ce qui concerne notre région plus particulièrement, nous avons eu à souffrir de délocalisation. Donc, ce sont des délocalisations de, de l'industrie traditionnelle qui soit euh, se termine, soit quitte. Euh, je veux parler de, de l'industrie sidérurgique, par exemple où nous étions euh, très forts et où maintenant nous nous n'avons plus que certains secteurs de pointe. So uh, in regards to our region specifically, uh, we had to go through a delocation. The whole uh, city uh, had to go through that process, and so uh, some traditional industries uh, had to face a situation whereby they either had to end this was, it was the end of the uh, industry, or they had to leave. This was the case, for example, for the steel workers. Donc la, la stratégie euh, n'est pas de, de jouer sur la mobilité ou la délocalisation. La stratégie est plutôt de jouer sur la création d'entreprises. So the strategy is not to uh, really uh, play with mobility or delocation as factors, but to really work on the strategy. Euh, en, en se basant sur certains points forts, donc j'ai parlé tout à l'heure du numérique, je peux parler de, de la bande dessinée et de l'industrie cinématographique, par exemple, où il faut des technologies fines, euh, l'université, tout, tout l'enseignement supérieur crée un, un substrat, une base euh, qui est présente et il faut faire fructifier cette base pour créer un nouveau tissu économique. So in order to create a new um, economic fabric, we need to create a base and that base has to be um, made more fruitful and for that, uh, we need to uh, strengthen the different sectors or elements that I've mentioned earlier, for example, the digital uh, sector, the, also the cartoon sector, the film industry, 
uh, and perhaps it needs to be uh, more sophisticated in terms of technology, but all the knowledge industry and all the academic world universities mm -hmm. have to come into play. Et euh, donc, ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que je suis aussi très heureux d'être avec des, des représentants de, de villes aussi, euh, de, de métropoles aussi importantes et aussi prestigieuses que les, euh, les intervenants euh, précédents re représentent. Et je crois que ce qui est important également, c'est toute cette culture urbaine, c'est-à-dire ce que représente la ville pour les jeunes, la culture, euh, la culture alternative, un cadre de vie où on trouve des facilités, euh, c'est également important pour la création d'entreprises, pour le, la qualité de vie des jeunes travailleurs, qui sont des travailleurs de grandes compagnies, ou de ceux qui vont investir leur argent, investir leur temps dans un endroit bien précis. Um, OK, so, um, I'm very happy to be here, by the way. I'd like to stress the fact that uh, this panel is uh, comprised of uh, very prestigious uh, guests uh, representing very prestigious uh, metropolis and cities. Uh, so um, I'd like to say uh, that uh, what's really important is the urban culture, and, and, and the meaning is important here, what cities actually mean for the youth, for example, in terms of uh, a meaning of um, cities equating culture, but also an alternative culture. And uh, it's important uh, to consider cities as, as a source uh, of jobs, for job creation, but in terms also of quality of life for workers who might work for greater businesses or not, or for investors. I'm going to throw this next question out as a general one. Anyone can jump in, but where do you see the future of the relationship between urban technology, small businesses, and cities going? Is there, do you have like a wish list for what you see happening in the future? Where do you see it going? Uh, is there any danger in the future that you think should be stopped? Just, just a general question on where you think we need to go from here. Um, I suggest we talk about disruption and okay. um, how administration almost on a global scale is, uh, is is blocking innovation on a large scale. Um, if you look at companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, how they are banned from many cities, or I mean, they they are they were young startups. Now they are large corporations. Um, that's a wonderful example of how structurally conservative administration tries to work for the incumbent to protect the incumbent. That's a typical theme that you see wherever you go. Large organizations have an extremely strong immune system. And whatever is changing, or every form of innovation, and most startups are about innovation, sort of are a threat. And so they try to kill it. And administration is extremely successful at killing that stuff. So that's something where the responsibility of administration in cities come in, comes in, so that we have to create protected areas. Uh, Tim yesterday mentioned that the public procurement procedure is completely broken, and he's right. I mean, if, if I, as a public company, um, want to do some purchasing, and I want to purchase something from a young startup, I mean, they don't fit basic criteria. That's absolutely impossible. I mean, I, I still do it from time to time, but that's a gray zone. Um, and I'm probably the exception in that respect. So it's extremely difficult. And their responsibility comes in of cities to create a climate of innovation, to foster startup culture, to change the way administration works, which is almost impossible. But at least it's worth trying by incentivizing bureaucrats in, different, in a different way, by trying to allow a failure culture to, um, to encourage them to make, to, to make errors which is unthinkable in the life of a bureaucrat. So his whole raison d'etre is not to make a mistake. And uh, I don't know of any bureaucrat who's ever been punished for not doing anything. It's only errors that gets punished. So that's something we have to work on as cities um, heavily. Uh, and I think we are making a little progress here and there, but it could be much better. Well, using your example of Uber, there's still a long way to go because I know of uh, yes. pitch battles. Yes. So you, I, what do you want to talk about I disruption? Will, I will definitely uh, follow uh, what you said, 
by saying that, first of all, uh, one danger that I'm seeing uh, in terms of big enterprises and big structure, they are trying to innovate internally. This is not, this is not gonna happen. Don't, please don't do that, don't do that. Uh, and this is a danger that I see mm. because you impose these constraints internally as well, even though you do an innovation lab, even though you're trying to do you know, innovation, but innovation doesn't mean anything if you're trying to do it the way you do everything else. It's not the way it's, it's going to happen. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, don't try to do that internally, go outside, go outside of your, of your company. Because as you said, you know, too, too, too big to fail is not true anymore, right? Uh, so so that's, that's, a, that's a big uh, red flag I raised because we see more and more of these labs and I don't think this is the, this is the way for a big organization to, uh, to, uh, to actually find real innovation and innovate and reinvent themselves. Um, and secondly, uh, for cities, yes, uh, there's a huge gap between the citizen uh, and the cities. Um, the cities are really uh, far back uh, behind and this gap uh, needs to be um, dealt with uh, and, and we're late. So I think uh, that's what we are trying to do. Um, it's, it's not easy and uh, city administrations are realizing it um, and they know that they need to go fast around it because you know what, civic engagement, uh, to get civic engagement and good civic engagement, you need to uh, be in, in relationship with your citizens. And if you're not in, able to interact with them the way they interact with the rest of the world, well, it's, you have a big problem. And and we, we do have a big problem. Sort of, uh, I've, I've mentioned this example several times already. Sort of the, the average age of uh, our administration is above 50. So particularly in sort of the city development agency in Berlin, the average age is 55 or 54, I think. In the next three years, 700 will leave. Most of them don't even have a smartphone. And they are supposed to lead us into the digital future? Yeah. Are you kidding me? So we have a structural problem. Yes. And we've got to work on that. If I can add on to that, um, I'll give a great example. My first job out of undergrad was at the Iowa Treasurer of State's office. I was in marketing and communications, and it was really inefficient, everything that they were doing. They were giving me work, I was doing it, and I was doing it too quickly, and they were like, <laughs> go, go slower, like take your time. <laughs> and so I kept asking for more work, more work, more work, and by the end of it, they uh, were like, all right, we're gonna have you s like join into this other department as well, and I took this woman's task, which was to do the state's entire due diligence which took her four months to do, and it's like stacks of papers like this and hundreds of them. They gave me this task. I took three hours and just kind of looked at the numbers, tried to figure out what was going on, was entering an M like they told me, and then by the end of the day, I went to our auditing officer and was like, what am I doing? Like, help me understand this because I just want to know so I can maybe do it more efficiently. Uh, and sh There was a part in the process where two people, three people were doing the same job multiple times. And so I was like, why are we doing it this way? She's like, I don't know, it's just how it's always been done. And she goes, well, can we actually, or I go, can we actually just have me do this, you do this, and you do that? And she's like, yeah, we should have been doing that the whole time. So I got done with this four months worth of work in one week. And that's huge. And when you're looking at state government, which is comprised of lots of little governments going, like, giving money to the state, lots of little entities here and there, that is a huge thing. And so one, innovation can come from within a big organization, like I did, and I brought it in. It just has to be welcomed. It can't be shut down. It has to be, you have to be able to listen to the people that are working on the ground and doing it, and not just being compliant because they need a job, but because they actually want to be there, they want to do something good for the society in general. In terms of small businesses um, and where tech can go, with what I am doing with pop-upsters is we're creating the, the whole vendor management side where we can help with procurement of bringing small businesses into state governments, but 
a lot of the businesses that we work for are very talented people. They just have no business skills because that's not what their creativity is. That's not where their passion is. They're not good at understanding numbers where there's people that are MBAs and they spend their entire education and their career trying to figure out how, like, how to understand those numbers. And they pay a lot of money to go to school to get those degrees. So let those people do those types of things for these businesses. Uh, and so we're using going to be making it a more of a fun way for businesses to understand their business and really dumb it down, if you will. Uh, not that these people are stupid, it's just it's not fun for them to look at numbers, but if you can do it in a fun way where you can see that you're profiting in certain areas uh, and you're not profiting in others, so like maybe you make an adjustment here or there, or maybe it's you're trying to figure out payroll and it's just more of a, hey, it's time to like, Pay your, like, pay your employees, here's a happy face, and the, like, whatever it might be, just make it more of a fun gamification type of experience than just trying to let small businesses do this all on their own and spend lots of money or waste lots of money trying to figure it out. Thank you. Louis? Donc, uh, à propos de la technologie, je pense que rien n'arrêtera la technologie. In regards to technology, I think that nothing will stop technology. Mm. Donc la, la preuve, c'est que nous, nous travaillons avec de nouveaux secteurs du numérique. Ça nous intéresse, donc nous devons accepter les conséquences de, de ce secteur qui est d'innover, de, de, de faire des découvertes et de, de changer finalement la société. So uh, the proof of that is that, uh, for example, in regards to the new digital sector, we're interested in that, but we have to accept what comes with it, which means that we have to innovate. On doit innover, eh? Uh, les, les innovations et, et les inventions changer la société. Yes, we must accept uh, that we ouais. need to innovate. We must innovate and do uh, mm -hmm. the changes that need to be done through invention mm -hmm. so that we can mm -hmm. change society. Les, les conséquences sont uh, uh, valables pour le secteur privé. Consequences are valid for the private et, sector. Et pour le secteur public. And for the public sector. Je vais donner un exemple qui concerne la, la ville de Liège que je ce que je connais le mieux. I'll give you an example ah, about ouais. Liège, that's ouais. the city that I know best. Donc, dans, dans un, un, un segment de la ville, nous avons, nous avons 3000 employés. We, we have 3000 employees in one uh, particular sector of the city. Nous avons mis en place un nouveau programme de suivi des dossiers administratifs. We've created a new program for uh, uh, the follow-up of administrative uh, files. Et uh, les conséquences ont été la super a été la suppression de plus de 200 postes de travail. And as a consequence, more than 200 work stations have been deleted. Donc, remplacé par un seul programme euh, performant, mais ça a créé un problème social à l'intérieur de la ville que nous avons dû résoudre. So, uh, these jobs have been replaced by a, uh, um, a program which has been highly successful and effective, but this has later created a social program in the city. Donc, so, social problem, sorry. Oui. Par euh, à la fois un programme de formation de ces agents qui n'avaient plus de poste. So we needed a training program for these people that oui. uh, those officers that no longer had a job. Oui. Euh, la fonction a été mise dans un cadre d'extraction. Uh, so their uh, position was uh, placed in a, in a framework of d'exception. Uh, d'extraction. Oh, of oui. extinction. Oui. Et euh, parallèlement, nous avons créé des places euh, de puéricultrices. Donc, nous avons remplacé les employés d'administration par des puéricultrices pour accueillir les enfants des nouveaux habitants. So we replaced those empl employee jobs by um, kindergarten jobs in order to welcome the employees. Okay. Qui travaillent donc dans ces nouvelles entreprises. Donc ça, c'est un système où finalement le, le côté technologique et le côté social de l'action publique peuvent se rejoindre. So it's a project uh, whereby the technological side of things and the social uh, considerations can go uh, and work hand in hand dans, dans la ville de demain. This is towards the city of the future. I love that. <laughs> If you're going to displace jobs, like you, they need to find some place else to work um, and maybe that could be a pop-up and they can start a small business, or it, maybe it's some other social uh, venture that happens within the community. Maybe they can build parks or do something else that uh, their skills match those, those levels. And 
just because you can bring on technology doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to help the community that much more because if you have 3,000 jobs displaced because you brought in an innovative technology, like those people are now unemployed. Uh, they might have pensions or something, but still, they, they still need to have something to do and something to work with. And if you're going to replace them, like those programs are great. So I want to leave a little time at the end for the audience to ask a question if there's anything interesting that they would like to know. But before I do, I want to make sure is there something that we haven't covered that you wanted to, to talk about or should I open it up? Silence. Does anyone have any questions, something they want to know about that uh, we haven't covered here on this topic? Just talk loudly and I'll repeat it. Or get the mic from the gentleman over there. No, I'm sp I, I, I hear you loud and clear about the question of, you know, ad admin public administrations being anti-disruption. And in Quebec, we've just lived a whole variety of situations that explain that. But what you haven't talked about, and I know this may be off topic a little bit, but is the role in the media of this. Uh, the, the, uh -huh. the, it's, 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 it's enormous. And any public administration that tries to encourage disruption or get with the flow of innovation gets swacked by the media right away for taking the risk of that. So how does that quell in innovation? How does that align or do not align with innovation? Could somebody maybe comment on that? Well, as the media representative up here, I guess I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, I certainly wasn't under the impression that we uh, smacked down anyone, any government uh, process that was trying to quell disruption. I mean, the most recent example in Quebec is Uber, uh, where I mean, personally, I'm a monstrous fan of Uber. I think it's a fantastic company and really innovative. And as someone who has had to take uh, taxis or around whatever, I thought for years it was kind of silly that you couldn't, like every single one of them didn't uh, accept uh, a Visa, a, a credit card. Uh, so uh, on that front, I'm a, I'm a supporter and I kind of, I'm one of the people who helps decide what gets run in the Gazette. Um, my feeling is that the media is actually reporting what's happening. I, I honestly don't believe that we are smacking down the governments for doing something, but what we are trying to do is hold them accountable when they go the other way, most likely. I mean, this again, in Montreal, they have, uh, well, more in Quebec than in Montreal, but we have bowed to what, what the taxi drivers basically were trying to hold the city hostage with uh, big events coming here. And then uh, Minister Daou said, oh, hey, well, we're going to cater taxis. And there was a whole uprising of people who were upset, who really enjoy Uber, and now they've put it off for three months. So th that tends to be more what the media, at least in my experience, uh, has an issue with, with something like this. It's more of the waffling and the back and forth. If there were more things like uh, in Liège, where they had programs to help support people who are displaced and move to other jobs, I, 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 I'd be stunned if the media had any problem with that whatsoever. But they don't talk about it at all. <laughs> they don't talk about the good things that are happening. At least in the US, it's very one-sided. It's all about the bad things going on. And it's not about the things that are being innovative. So you're kind of discouraged from doing anything at all except what your job is because it's either the media or your boss is going to like, what are you doing? Don't just be compliant. So um, I, that might be different here in Montreal and what you're doing. But I really don't see a lot of good reporting on what's happening. Uh, no, we're overall. accused of being negative too. I'm not uh, downplaying that. Uh, the, the role of media is, is very important, of course, but I mean, if, if you, we talked about how, what a city can do to foster innovation and attract startups and talent and everything. And, uh, and this morning I read a story in TechCrunch on, uh, about Austin. I mean, first they banned Uber and Lyft, and now if you have this Facebook group of 30,000 members uh, who, who developed kind of a self-organized car sharing system, and now the city administration is uh, clamping down on the drivers, taking part in that with undercover police officers. I mean... What? Wow. What? <laughs> it's kind of... Are you completely nuts? I mean, is there any startup or any talent in the world that will ever consider going to Austin, Texas after this story? I mean, how silly is that? And uh, I mean, if, if, if media <laughs> begin to pick up on stories like this more aggressively, I think then, then the positive role uh, sort of, of, of media comes in. But in, uh, sort of in general, it's, it's more the, op the opposite. It's quite true, sort of they... Je crois que pour répondre à la, à la question du rôle des médias, uh, so I believe that in order to answer uh, your question about the role of the media, the media, uh, vous avez raison de dire qu'un programme doit être équilibré. You're right in saying that a program must be balanced. 
Et il doit aussi euh, intégrer la, le problème de la communication. It must also entertain or consider the communication problem. Quand, quand vous avez un projet, vous devez pouvoir l'expliquer. Et expliquer pourquoi, euh, tous ensemble, on sera mieux demain avec ce projet. Et vous devez savoir jusqu'où l'opinion publique va vous suivre. Parce qu'on ne gouverne pas contre le peuple. Because we cannot govern against the people. Et je voudrais, si vous permettez, donner un, un exemple très récent. If I may, I'd like to give you a, a very recent Donc, example. Nous, nous avons un, un grand projet urbanistique basé sur la culture et la mobilité autour de la gare euh, TGV. So we have a great urban project uh, around culture and mobility. This is around the TGV uh, train station. Qui applique, train. Qui applique euh, la démolition d'une maison qui a un peu de caractère. So uh, it means uh, the project means that a house which has uh, some uh, characteristics, oui, oui, historic. some historic character, will be demolished. Oui. Uh, les, le, certains mouvements citoyens ont écrit uh, à la mairie, donc c'est une pétition de plusieurs milliers de signatures pour défendre cette maison. So uh, thousands of citizens have uh, signed a petition uh, to prevent that event, to prevent the house to be demolished. This is a citizen movement. Oui. Nous avons à la fois répondu à chaque personne. So the petition was uh, uh, submitted to the, the city hall and we've answered to each one oui. of the petitioners. Oui. Mais nous avons surtout inauguré une nouvelle passerelle piétonne qui est dans l'axe euh, de la gare. Donc la, la maison est entre la passerelle et la gare. So we've also inaugurated a new pedestrian bridge between oui. The train station, uh, la, gare et la gare et la passerelle qu'on vient d'inaugurer sur le fleuve. Uh, and the, ouais. the new uh, bridge that's just, ouais. just been inaugurated Donc vous avez on the river. la passerelle, la maison et la gare. So you have the train ouais. station, the house and the pedestrian ouais. bridge. Et euh, maintenant, les gens auxquels nous avons répondu nous écrivent, nous vous avons compris. So the, the people that we've answered, uh, they write us and they say, We have understood. Oui. Et vous pouvez détruire la maison parce qu'elle est dans le chemin. D'un grand projet. It wasn't the way of a big oui. project. Ok. <laughs> voilà. I would, I would, uh, I would say two words. Manage expectations. If you are doing something innovative, why don't you say to the population, guys, we're trying something. It might not be perfect. But we're trying, right? Yep. Uh, I think it can, and, and I've seen examples of this, and it can save a lot of headaches and debates and uh, bad fate of uh, certain citizens that uh, don't like innovation. I think if you bring innovation, just don't promise it's going to change the world and be fantastic. We're trying something. Let's see. But, How it goes. But, but you have to raise expectations of your investors to, to fund raise. I mean, it's that, a careful that, balance. Yeah, it's a, it's a careful balance. I mean, in, in the end, people love to see other people fail. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why <laughs> the word Schadenfreude is known <laughs> in most other languages. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know? And it, yeah. it's very human, but you've, you've got to deal with it. Anyway. But there's a lot of stuff coming. I mean, you asked about um, tech earlier. There's a lot of stuff coming along currently, big time, like 3D printing. Even, I mean, we are printing houses now, which is absolutely exciting. I mean, the whole building industry is, I mean, it's the least innovative industry on earth. And that's about to get disrupted. And I love it. It's yeah. such a great thing. Um, and, and there's a good number of people really scared. And they're not only from Volkswagen. You know? <laughs> and uh, I mean, there's nothing as good as a good crisis for innovation. And uh, we have a whole series of crises now. I mean, the whole artificial intelligence uh, coming along, mm -hmm. the whole virtual reality stuff and augmented reality. Um, it will change the way we work and live and communicate and uh, collaborate. It's fantastic. Um, 3D printing is only one example on, of how production will change. And you can 
onshore production all of a sudden, away from Asia back to Europe, to America, because in the end, the cost is always the same. It's not about labor. No? So we have to smarten up in other areas. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that future, but there's a lot of resistance to change, a lot of resistance. But, you know, startups, they, they start, they, they bring a, a product on the market that is most of the time not perfect, and they improve it with the help of their end users. Absolutely. Right? So why, a, you know, a CD can, can do that in a certain extent? You know, make a promise that, look, we're, we're, we're trying this, um, we want your feedback, we will improve it as we go. And because you know, if sometimes I'm not, I'm not talking in every single cases, but in, in some cases, you know, you can bring innovation and you can bring a promise saying, look, we're, we're trying this, help us making it better and you know, city. work together, collaborate. Yeah, collaboration. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful idea. Take the case of open data. You know? Exactly, uh, you, and that's you, one I mean, case we, in Montreal. We've got a beautiful open data initiative. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about Berlin again, um, with, I don't know, 800 or 1,000 data sets. And now you go to the administration and say, could I please have that, that data included in our open data project? Guess what? Nope. Their job was basically to protect data, to keep it. You know, it's their power, it's their raison d'etre again. It's extremely difficult. I mean, the ownership of data is such an issue. I, I actually don't understand why it is such an issue, p particularly for, for government and public administration. They don't know what to do with it anyway. I mean, they don't have the capacity. They don't even know what data analytics is. So why are they hanging on to it? So, um, again, sort of with, with um, Tim, I had a discussion earlier where we basically said, so why don't we give all these data sets to academia, to universities, and they work with it? And then industry, startups can ask questions and, um, and, and academia can help to solve those questions with the data provided by the public realm. I mean, they are financed by taxpayers' money anyway. I totally agree, but it doesn't seem the governments do agree. Have you had an issue with openness uh, with, with people who are looking for something like data or, or, or just anything that... Uh, some idea comes down, and because of the status quo or or, or just big government, it's unable to to, to work in in your in Liège, for, which is what you know, I assume. Oui. Mais donc, si si on parle de l'ouverture par rapport aux données, if we're talking about openness in regards donc, to data, nous, nous avons, et je crois que c'est le cas aussi, un premier mouvement est venu de Berlin. And uh, I believe that, that uh, the first, uh, cas, les, the first les, example of that came from Berlin. Les Liégeois qui militent pour l'open data uh, se revendiquent des mouvements berlinois. So the Liège right. citizens uh, who um, advocate this uh, openness uh, in the field of data, they, they claim that they are inspired by uh, Berliners. Berliners. Yeah. Je pense que l'open data fait partie de l'évolution naturelle de la société. So open data is part of the natural evolution of society. À partir du moment où um, on milite pour le numérique, et tout le monde milite pour le numérique, uh, cela va de pair avec l'open data. C'est d'ailleurs l'open data qui permettra la créativité à partir du numérique. Ce sont les données qui sont la base de, des innovations de demain, notamment dans la gestion des villes, et principalement dans la gestion des villes. So uh, data will, uh, will, uh, will help us to manage uh, the future tomorrow, especially in the field of uh, the management of cities. From the moment when we, uh, uh, we accept uh, the digital reality, then, uh, for example, something like open data technology uh, enables us to be more creative. Uh, so digital creativity is very important. So data uh, will uh, enable us to create uh, uh, future cities. But the question is, who is us in that case? It will help us to create a better future, blah, blah, blah. So who is the us? Hmm? Nous, la société, en général, donc c'est à la fois le secteur public, euh, le secteur privé, les citoyens. Donc moi, j'essaie je, de voir les choses euh, globalement, euh, et c'est une question pour moi de, de démocratie, de transparence, de gouvernance, mais aussi de d'économie. So for me, uh, I, it's a matter of democracy, uh, of economy. Also, I try to see things globally. 
But when I talk about us, it's society, uh, the public sector, the private sector, citizens in general. Mm -hmm. Et euh, si je peux encore ajouter une chose, I may add euh, je dirais que dans la gestion publique, il peut peut-être avoir euh, existé un secteur réservé où, euh, dans certains dossiers ou dans certains domaines, on doit peut-être euh, avoir une information plus mesurée. Euh, plus limitée Plus limitée, oui. So, uh, for public management, uh, with a nuance that uh, perhaps for certain fields or sectors, Uh, information should be uh, restricted off limits uh, for certain files or um, fields. In, in, in Montreal, we, the, the city of Montreal issued their open data by default. Um, so, uh, so th this is great. So, so now you know you have to you have to actually fight internally if you don't want the data to be uh, open. So that's great. But when they released their policy, they said that guys, look for the for the past. We're, we're trying hard to make everything available, but bear with us. It's going to happen. We're working on it. It's not ready. If they, but, but in certain, uh, certain administration, maybe they would have waited five years again to make sure that they have the perfect platform, that all the, ta the data is in the right format and everything. Well, I, I applaud that because they said, we will go with what we have, uh, and now it's open data uh, by default. And we move forward, and we don't wait that everything is perfect. And we're very blunt about it and honest about it. So for me, it's a, it's it's a, it's managing expectations. Right. That's like that's a startup mentality too. It's iterate fast yep. and like get it going as as quickly as possible. And uh, back to the media question and Uber uh, in Austin, um, the there's so much. The reason why Uber and Lyft or Airbnb is getting so much uh, pushback is because they're displacing jobs, or they are perceived to be displacing jobs. Airbnb, we're partners with them. Um, we're partners with Lyft. Uh, I don't really like Uber, so <laughs> whatever to that. But um, they're not necessarily displacing jobs. They're making it more convenient and more affordable for the citizens. And when you have the taxi cab services and commissions uh, fighting for these rights, great, they can do that and go lobby and get that going, but they need to innovate themselves. They can't be back 100 years ago and be saying, like, or the hotel industry and say, like, this is what's going to happen. There's always going to be people taking taxis. If you're going from the airport to anywhere, you're gonna, like, and you're coming from a country or a city where there's not an Uber or Lyft, you're going to have a taxi. There's also medical taxis for am like with ambulances that carry people that are handicapped. Nobody has a handicap carrying car, so they like maybe they innovate and start doing stuff like that. Same thing with hotels like well maybe start putting kitchens in your hotel like you know there's never going to be a, especially in cities like San Francisco where where there's lots of conventions these hotel rooms are always going to be full. It's just a cheaper alternative for people to experience the same thing that mainly the business class has been able to experience, a higher business class has been able to experience in the past. Well, thank you. Well, we're coming up on the end of our time now, so I just wanted to thank my esteemed panelists here for a pretty engaging conversation and an enlightening one for me and for all of you for being here. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>